great if the the city came together to make something. So we worked with all of the venues. There's 45 venues in the city, and we put, we brought like 450 artists or something. It was crazy. Like we took over the whole place with the navy, brought in a vessel, and we'd party on navy ships, and it was bananas. But it was amazing. <laughs> yeah, and because it was such a kind of a thing that unified the city and the arts scene in Cork. We were like, well, we have to do it again. It was just such a positive experience for everybody. Well, how long did the festival run for in that first Four days. And once it was finished, did you see the kinds of seeds of collaboration continue? Did it change the setup of, you know, the, that's... Yes, it's not yeah, absolutely. Not talking to yeah, people. and this DIY mentality really took off around the city too. It was like this can-do attitude, just like, what are you waiting for? Just do it. Yeah. And so then how does people start to come out of this as like an umbrella and a philosophy? What comes first, like the idea of the community or the festival idea? Uh, well, I think people, this notion of, you know, the only reason it's called people to begin with was um, when we gathered for the first time uh, in Berlin, so there was an event in 2016 in the summer um, that we can talk more about. But there was an artist <clears throat> who uh, it was a it was a big takeover of the old East German radio campus, the Funkhaus in East Berlin, that had been abandoned and then reclaimed. And anyways, there were a hundred artists that came to do a residency there, and, and and one of those artists was Eric Carlson, visual artist, and he made this giant banner with the word people and um but we know there was never any discussion like of calling it that it just was hanging over this one space yeah. so then people started calling it that but i feel like the seeds of what became people and now 370d or 3d because we got sued by people magazine um, <laughs> really? <laughs> yeah so that's like we write people upside down using letter numbers and and small uh letters now but um the seeds of this idea go way back to and it's nothing nothing that we've invented it's really just a i, I kind of start by saying my brother and i grew up collaborating we never were alone playing music basically and so many you know as we've gotten older um i feel like when we really make creative breakthroughs any artist it's because there's some sort of cross-pollination or openness to other people's ideas or chemistry that you're having with some new work that you're making with people and we've just been seeking all throughout the history of like the national and other projects that we've done um, we've been trying to find ways to give artists and ourselves time and space to collaborate and to not just come play the same songs that you always play but what what if what if there's an opportunity to to actually make something new with people you haven't met before or people you've always wanted to work with. And so that's like, at least in our community, the first iteration of this was Music Now, mm -hmm. which is Bryce, my brother, started an avant-garde sort of music festival in Cincinnati, Ohio, where we're from 15 years ago. Mm -hmm. And the idea there was always, it was commissioning new work. So you were never invited just to play the songs that you play every day on tour or you know, some piece that you wrote 10 years ago. It was always about new commissions and it was a small community festival, not for profit, always kind of scraping by and my mom helped run it. And, you know, it was just this, this small thing and we all, all our friends kind of pitched in. Um, but it's our, a lot of our favorite music started there and a lot of the, our relationships, which last until today, started there. Um, so I guess that was like the first people event I think in a sense because it was very collaborative and very about new work about giving artists you know, inviting artists to come do something new um, and but it's just sort of progressed into all these different iterations now and experiments kind of all over the world I guess but Cork is another one where it's like mm -hmm. music now is feeding into what Cork was but Mary was bringing this whole other mm -hmm. notion of what if it's sprawling all over the city you know mm -hmm. um, there's, I mean, a bunch of other festivals as well that you're all involved in from yeah. uh, Harvin, which is in Denmark, and yeah. Eau Claire, which is in Wisconsin. Yeah. It's interesting that you, I think a lot of people think that, you know, musicians are all operating in kind of a communal environment all the time, but the, I suppose, the financial demands of the music industry means that maybe that's not necessarily the case. It's interesting that you've had to create these spaces as opposed to them already being available. Mm -hmm. It's, yeah, I think... It's very, the music industry is designed to put walls around artists generally. So like even going back 
decades, you know, the infrastructure of the music industry tends to, whether it's your record label or your agent or your booking agent, your manager, whoever, they're kind of like territorial and, and also seeking to maximize the, whatever the bird in hand is. So like if it's the national, for example, <clears throat> most, most opportunities that the national has are sort of either like, yeah, come headline our festival and, and, and the audience just sort of has expectations of that we're going to play all our, you know, our new album and maybe some songs people know. And, and it's easy to sell tickets to that kind of thing because the audience is, knows the band and, or the, and, you know, the manager and the booking agent know there's a framework for that. And so that's kind of whether you're big or small, and I've toured at every level so like for years, nobody paid attention to our band and we used to drive ourselves crazy, like driving around, trying to find an audience, playing for no one, playing for three people, and then all the way up to headlining Primavera or whatever and seen it all along the way. But there's very few opportunities as a band, even that's like popular to actually do something different. Yeah. And like you're rarely invited to come, hey, the national come just work on something new or hey, you know, Aaron and Bryce and other friends, you know. Um, so I guess, yeah, we've had to create, it's not to say that they, those residencies and like all tomorrow's parties, and there's been many, there've been great examples of things like this, mm -hmm. um, but the industry tends to, certain parts of the industry tend to like make it hard. So like we used to get in trouble with music now. For example, like years ago, like Sufjan Stevens is the a good example, he played that festival many times, but always we would have to like ask him personally because if we would ask his booking agent, they would make it complicated because we don't have any money or we don't, you know, we's, we, we just want to come for the sake of coming. So we can talk about that, like some of the economic issues, but um, yeah, it's... And you're saying at Music Now, um, people have to present new music, but with that first festival in Berlin, the musicians all spent five days working in the Funk House and working in the Michelberger Hotel before it was open to the public that weekend. Yeah. Was that the first time that actually making the music had been part of the event, as it were, that people didn't arrive with something new, it all had to take shape that week? No, I think many of the other events followed that format, but what was different about Berlin is the number of musicians who came together. I think there was like maybe 150 the first time, um, many of whom didn't know each other. Some came with some ideas, some came with nothing, some knew nobody and was like, were completely intimidated and were like, oh, Tuesday going, I want to go home, it's not working for me. Um, but like finding the way to open them up many, like in many instances, it was in the social side of these events where you'd see people talking in the court and you're like, oh, what's going on over there? And the next day they're playing, they're trying something out together. You know, it was, I think, yeah, the difference for Berlin 2016 was the amount of people, I think. But like for Music Now and Sounds from a Safe Harbor, we would have had days leading into right. performance time. Like we had a residency in a castle and there's more before the first mm -hmm. um, Sounds from a Safe Harbor Festival. So it's like it, that the model has existed. Right. Yeah. I feel like maybe um, the one in Berlin was the first time that it was like, I don't know, very public knowledge that this was what was happening. I'm really interested in how you put an event like this together. And because you know, it was very non-hierarchical, when you put the poster out, it wasn't like the National and Bon Iver at the top. It was everybody's names alphabetically from dancers to visual artists to the musicians who were taking part in it. Was it hard to, you know, talk people into the concept and like you're saying, get around that kind of booking agent mentality? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's quite challenging even for as many artists who, when you first approach them about this idea, they're kind of confused and sort of, it's taken a while to kind of learn how to communicate this idea. Um, because again, we wanted, so the, the way the, the first event in 2016 in Berlin, we, we, as Laura was saying, we made, uh, initially we had this idea of nameless, faceless, which actually is not really the right way to think about it. But basically, instead of big, bold face band names, you know, and trying to market an event the way they're traditionally done, we just thought, what if everyone's on the same mm -hmm. level and it's just a list of names? Um, and that way, also the audience is coming for dis like the purpose of discovery and to be part of this like new kind of event where 
it is a little bit mysterious because you don't know what you're going to see. I still, I still love that idea, but we've, in terms of the practicality of it and the way you schedule it and the way you, you know, there are, there are logistical issues you confront when you put a hundred artists in a space and just say, go. Uh, so Mary's kind of, a, can talk about that a little bit, but um, I still think that we're, you know, we're, it's very, it's, I still think this movement is, is in its, first chapter so it's still we're still educating we're still learning about this and also educating the uh, the public as far as this idea because it's only happened you know a few times mm -hmm. and we just did one in new york at pioneer works this amazing kind of arts space gallery in red hook brooklyn and we had 20 artists together for a week and then performances over two days mainly with two stages. And that was a di very different than the 200 artists in the Funkhaus in Berlin. But we learned a lot, you know, it was, it was more focused and it was, in a way, it was easier for the audience because they didn't miss anything. They, no everyone saw everything, which was interesting. Um, but yeah, so there's still this idea of a non-hierarchical program where there aren't headliners. We're not trying to sell tickets off one person or one band's name. But it's hard because the audience and the media and the way things are marketed, it's still a challenge, you know, because why would I go <clears throat> spend money, you know, I think I can imagine for people that are just uh, thinking about what they want to do on the weekend, you know, it's still a challenge to how do you bring people into this concept. Mm -hmm. uh, luckily, we've had great audiences so far, so. Mm -hmm. um, and then I should say another point, this, the one in Brooklyn that we just did in Red Hook, was the first time, the ones in Berlin, all the artists came and participated and had room and board, but no one was paid. And the, the one in, that we just did in Red Hook, everyone was paid a stipend and everyone gets the same amount. So whether you're, you know, Justin Vernon or you're unknown, you know, experimental artist, you get the same, yeah. which is a great feeling for everyone. So. Um, I was at the first Berlin one and spent the week there with you and then was at the, the weekend part. And it was really interesting seeing the audience engage with it. Like, I think everybody knew they were going to get at least one Bon Iver performance, so they had like that reassurance, but then you would walk into a room and they were often very hot and people would be sitting there sweating, looking a bit stressed, being like, what's about to happen? What am I missing elsewhere? But then like the wonder would unfurl in front of them. But um, the thing that I really took away from it was it's, you know, we live in a very product orientated like music consumption world and it really made me realize how much the actual process of creativity is probably a lot more fun for everybody, like everybody involved in the making of it than actually the thing that you have to then sell and tour for like a couple of years. Do you think it's realistic that we can like re-engineer audiences to appreciate that side of it? Like, can they ever have the same enjoyment of watching the process as the, like the finished product? There's definitely work to be done in that area from our perspective. Like. There is still confusion about what we are, I think, and how we do things. And, and it's not always easy to get an audience to engage with what it is we're trying to do. Um, so there's, there's learning from both sides still. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we're still figuring it out. Yeah, I think there's, it can be exhilarating when something flies, when yeah. it's like when there's magic to see something spontaneous and really brand new brand new and that kind of you know, you only get those moments with any project when it when the something clicks and if you're an audience in the room with that and part of it I think that's some of my most favorite experiences as a listener are that but it also means that there's going to be times where it doesn't work yeah. or something is like feels like you're um, maybe watching someone rehearse or something but um that's kind of a tension that we like, but it is something that we're that we are learning from. So maybe the in Pioneer Works it was a little different because it was more focused and there was only twenty artists, so you didn't have the feeling. It wasn't as crazy as like some of the performances maybe in Berlin, where it's just you know there are two hundred artists and uh, many many different spaces, and it was kind of like this weird maze of of uh, for the audience so, mm -hmm. to navigate. We should talk about that building. It's one of the coolest places I've ever been. So it's called the Funk House, and it um, it was the old East German radio studios. How did you find this place, and why did you want to set set it there? I think Andre de Ritter was recording there, right? She was recording um, there with Bryce. Yeah. So it's the the Funk House, which maybe some of you know. It's this the the old East German radio campus built in the fifties at like the height of German acoustical 
you know, engineering. So like I went all the great uh, German microphone companies and then engineers were thinking about how to record stuff. So each room in this crazy, it's like a village along the spree and it has hundreds of studios in it and theaters and they're all different. They all have different reverb times and different types of sound insulation in the walls and the ceilings and when the when the berlin wall fell it kind of went into you know when when germany was unified it, it kind of went into disrepair or was abandoned and then a, a wealthy kind of banker guy bought it like 10 years ago and has been and I, he's he's a great guy but he's been rehabilitating it and I, by the this was maybe five or six years ago bryce was well, probably four years ago, was uh, recording strings or needed to record string orchestration for Alejandro Inarito's movie, The Revenant. So Bryce helped do the score for that movie. And, and there's a great uh, Berlin-based orchestral conductor, Andre de Ritter, who already was working in the Funkhaus and the Mouse on Mars uh, musicians were also there working. And so there were people that we knew and Bryce went to um, there to record strings and was just like, whoa, this is crazy. Like, what if we could do something here? And that's kind of when the idea started to happen. Um, and and they were, it, it was in its early days of being like a place people were coming back to work. So it was still possible. And it's, you know, we just did it again, but it, it, there's more happening there now, so. Mm -hmm. Did it feel, given the, the history of that building as somewhere that produced really tightly controlled kind of government output creativity, did that feel symbolic that you were like exploding it for a week? Absolutely. I mean, they were making music in the corridors, like anywhere they could find space. They were, it, was, it was alive in every way. It was amazing. Yeah. One of my favorite details I remember from being there is that originally when they built one of the studios, it had like a 2.9 second reverb, but that was considered too long. So they tore down the whole thing. And so it was 2.3. Yeah. Just like, okay, wow. yeah. Um, I mean, performing in front of an audience and creating in private are two really different things. When you're kind of creating something in front of people, does the act of being observed change it? Is it nerve wracking to do that? <clears throat> I, I think it is, it's, it depends on where you're coming from. So a lot of musicians aren't used to like there's an over-preparedness, I think, of our generation. And so many artists now that you watch in concert are actually playing the tracks. Even if it seems like they're playing live, they're like, the drummer has a click in his earpiece and there's all kinds of stuff, you know. It's kind of overly, like if you grew up, I grew up idolizing like the Grateful Dead or something and who were constantly flying by the seat of their pants and never playing the song the same way. And for them, improvising, Playing songs while also improvising was normal, but then um, I think a lot of music today is is very structured and kind of tightly wound, and it's like pop music or um, you know even the national. It's it, we don't improvise a whole lot. We're trying. We've, we've kind of been moving more in that direction more recently, but so it's it's not super comfortable to get up and just like for a lot of musicians to get up and try something new in front of people. Cause it's like, there's a, you know, you feel vulnerable or you feel embarrassed, but, but actually um, once you take that wall down, it's, it's liberating. And actually I, th I feel like that's being a musician is being able to listen and respond yeah. in real time. Um, and that's a, it's a like, it's a lost art in a way. I mean, I think um, what happened, I mean, so for example, the project um, that Justin Vernon and I are here to do is called Big Red Machine. And that was really just, it happened by accident, essentially, where we just wanted to, we had written a song years ago uh, for a charity compilation called Big Red Machine, uh, ten, more than 10 years ago for Dark Was the Night. And then uh, as part of a festival in Wisconsin that we do called Eau Claire, we thought of just doing an improvised set. And so we got up to improvise and it, it was just this explosive thing happened where we were like, oh, maybe this is something we like doing. And so we kept doing it. And after having done it for maybe 10 times, there seemed to be an album, you know, but it never would have happened if we hadn't just 
gotten on that stage to do it. And I think that's what we're interested in is like trying to encourage as many people and as many musicians from diverse communities to take that step of just getting outside of the lane that you're in and, and work with someone that you might not normally work with or, or throw yourself over that sort of wall and just create uh, in a way that you're not used to. And then things happen. There's really, um, and I've been lucky to have many opportunities like that. So I know that stuff happens, even like the best national songs, for example, most of them were improvised. Like at the end of the session, after all the songs were recorded, then like, I'll just, or you know, maybe Brian and I improvise something. So like Mr. November is an example of that. It wasn't a song. It was just like a fuck around. And then it became a song, you know. So anyways, I don't know if that answers your question. But Yeah, yeah. I was going to say, you know, why do you think that over-preparedness has set in? Is it something that you think has got, or that you've seen get more kind of um, concerted over the 20 years that you've been in a band? <clears throat> yeah, I think it's, I think it's the downside of the, availability of software to the extent like anyone in their bedroom in a good way it's democratized recording so that with recording software on your laptop or even just like now your phone or something you can make great recordings and you can elaborately structure them and produce them without access to recording studios um, or high-end audio technology which is great that's a great thing but it it also means that a lot of artists rely heavily on their process and going down the rabbit holes of like and I do it too it's like I can't recreate that thing I happened on accident so I have to play to it or press play on something you know and we you know even Big Red Machine does that so it's like I can't recreate that weird drum machine that was going through that pedal into that amplifier and then I recorded with my phone you know so um but I think more and more artists do rely on like a kind of performance that's uh I don't know it's the downside of what we call Spotify core it's like you're just trying to like you know break cut through the noise and appeal as quickly as you as possible so there's this push towards the production levels can on a lot of music are very, um, I don't know how to say it, it's like pushed in a way where there's not a lot of space to just allow something to congeal slowly or to have quiet, like very quiet dynamics. If you go to, a, not Primavera, because Primavera is a special festival, but a lot of music festivals in the US, you're not, you don't see very many bands playing or very many, a lot of live, truly live music. It's a lot of like, tracks and they're played very loud and it's a fun party and I'm, I'm not saying it's a bad thing but it, it feels different than like uh you know watching something new unfold I guess is what I'm saying because it changes the expectations of the audience as well when everything seems very kind of like professionalized and slick yeah. being presented with something unfinished in a good way is surprising and like shocking hard for people to get their head around um, so after that first Berlin weekend, um, Aaron, I think you and Justin uh, spent a week in Wisconsin, like the following March, talking about what the next steps were going to be. How did you envisage like the platform and the community spanning out from there? Um, well, so, yeah, the, I think the the first Berlin gathering at the Funkhaus when there were 100 artists and so it was a transcendent experience for so many people and so many seeds were planted and... I think the resounding feeling was, why can't this happen more often? Or why can't we live like this? Why can't music making feel like this? And, you know, giving, <clears throat> and can we widen the circle somehow? And our friends from the Michelberger Hotel and us and a bunch of other people were like, we're thinking about this, how to answer this question. And one strong idea that emerged was, what if there was a home for this kind of music? So you gather, you have a residency, and then you have performances that happen, and there's all these seeds planted. And when those seeds grow into records or bands or live recordings or whatever it is, where do they live? How does it get distributed? How can the world listen to this? Is it a radio station? Is it a, is it a digital service provider, website? So all these questions we were thinking about and eventually we settled on the idea of building a platform 
um, which would allow easy collaboration and pu publishing of work. So you could easily, we could sit here right now and I'll play the piano and you guys write melodies and we'll record it on my phone and then we could upload it <laughs> um, to the people platform and we could share the authorship, we could sh assign revenue shares and kind of co-work on music and none of us will have to, if we don't want, sign a record deal and go on tour and take a picture of ourselves and market ourselves. It could be as simple as just a one-time piece of music that we're all attached to. So we built this platform that basically allows as much uh, contextualization of the music as you want. So you can assign as many collaborators to any piece of content. It's easy to use. You can um, tell a story about it. You can, you know, um, on the back end, it's very on the on the back end of this platform is really where the innovation is, where you have to define what your who the who the authors of the work are, who the in 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 how the revenue is going to be shared. So we thought through a lot of these issues that kind of are difficult for musicians and and cause problems down the road if you don't think about them. Um, and the and the idea is like if Spotify and Apple and the various DSPs have reduced the, the amount of metadata that you see down to like, you see only, you know, if you, yeah, there are people tracks on Spotify and you, you'll only see the first name, for example. But I used to love, we all love vinyl and in vinyl liner notes, you can see everything that you want to see. And so we wanted to create something that had that level of detail. Um, so yeah, we spent a lot of time. We launched this platform, and um, and it was amazing. It was a lot of fun. It was like a great experiment. It's not. Uh, I think it's it's also an experiment, and I don't know if that's the future of what we're doing. Um, it was kind of, but it helped us to really think about this process. But what we really, I think, the focus of this movement is about music making and residencies. And these residencies can move around the world to different places and hopefully encompass other people. So in a way, it was good to think about how this music can live in the world, but it's not totally the point. The point is more in the actual music making and this collectivist uh, sort of residency program, I guess. You mentioned that you don't have to do all the like, you know, promotion and photos, the usual kind of PR grind around it. Does that mean that people should interpret people as um, like a challenge to the traditional music industry? Or is it just like an alternative, you know, opportunity for musicians to pursue alongside that thing? It's not me meant to be an alternative. Um, <clears throat> it can sit side by side with everything else, yeah. It's, yeah, it's not meant to be in opposition to anything, but I do think uh, these, it, it, it helps. It, what we've been doing prompts a lot of questions. Mm -hmm. So out of, uh, there's records that have happened because of these residencies. And then there's a big question of how do you promote a record that's made, that's not a band really, or that's not supposed to be about the solitary genius or this, you know, whatever, this kind of, we're not trying to create a hype story because generally to break through the noise in the music industry, you have to create as much attention on something as you can. Mm -hmm. And the album cycles are shorter and shorter and shorter. So in that world, how does, you know, how do you release music into that world and hopefully get an audience for it? So we've had a lot of soul searching about that. Um, and we have different ideas. They're always evolving and it's kind of a conversation. Um, but yeah, it's not really meant to be in opposition to the music industry because I think the best parts of the music industry, Primavera being an example, or some of the record labels, independent record labels that we work with are like substantive journalism. There's There are very healthy, positive things that you can lean on. Mm -hmm. uh, but then there is a lot of you know, increase, it's like there's the McDonald's too, you know, and there's a lot of that. So it's like, there's a lot of people making French fries also. Um, so <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's kind of a, we talk, but it's, it's a con, nobody has the answer, which is kind of cool. It's like everybody has a different perspective, including within our little community. So there's like a lot of, a lot of battles that wage. How readily and easily does the community expand? How do people become members of people? Could like, you know, somebody with a demo give it to you and say, we want to be part of this? Well, the way the platform is set up is it's currently for anybody and everybody. So people can contact us for an artist login and just put their music up there. That was the intention. 
Um, but with the with the events and going back to the focus being in the physical coming together of human beings and like the real world, um, we're we're wondering if like our direction or focus should be on that the output that comes through that first and foremost. So we're still we're still discovering and changing and responding, and it's still organically kind of revealing itself to us. Um, but, but but our purpose being to respond to what the community need and want. Mm -hmm. What you were saying that um, that it's uh, you know proposed questions to you about the purpose and the function of this thing. In what other ways has it challenged you or challenged your thinking about the way that something like this could work? It's challenged everything about how I work. Like mm -hmm. I'm a control freak, <laughs> and like letting things evolve and re responding in real time, like it goes against every fiber of my being. Like I want a, I want a spreadsheet, I want to know what's <laughs> happening all the time. So the first Berlin, I had, I had a kind of a breakdown. I think I was, I was broken down and rebuilt and had to learn. I don't know that anyone, it's ever been done at, to that extent before. So it's like there was, there's no, there's no one who could have taught me how to do it. I had to just learn on the ground. But like, you know, it's about being, being super patient and waiting for the fruit to drop until, you know, the artists come into the room and go, oh, we got an idea. And you're like, yes, but they could come in tomorrow and go, it didn't actually work out. So take it off the table, you know, and just waiting, waiting and like encouraging and helping people figure stuff out. But yeah, I was, I was a wreck, but everyone was a wreck yeah. <laughs> for a certain part of the week, right? And everything just comes back together at the weekend and we're all like, oh my God, it's amazing. But I had to learn, I had to relearn everything. I can imagine it's the literal flip side of working somewhere like an opera house, which yeah. I've never worked at an opera house, but I imagine it might Planned be a normal environment. All years, and you know what's going to go on like four years down the line, you know. But with this, you don't know what's going to happen in an hour's time. And you've got to react quickly. I, uh, <clears throat> I think for artists, the learning curve, it's like multifaceted. One thing that I've had to learn is my limits. Like my, and a lot of artists there, I think you just, the temptation is to run around and play with as many people as you can and just experience as many different uh, performative and collaborative mm. constellations as you can, just because you're just soaking in, you're just, it's not, it's a chance to grow. Um, so the first funk house, I probably played 12 shows a day mm -hmm. or something and my feet hurt because I was like literally running with like All guitars and I had so much fun. But then I, then I would like completely crash for months afterwards and have no energy for anything or something. And, um, and then, so I had to learn from that. This last time in Brooklyn, I just did two performances a day or something because I knew mm -hmm. And, and tried to focus on making those great. And they felt new, and there was new material for both. Um, but, but then the other thing that's challenging, as we discussed before, for artists coming into it for the first time, just having the, you know, because we don't generally with these residencies, the idea is not to come in with like a pre-planned sense of what you're doing, to kind of come in with an open mind. Maybe you have some material that you want to work on. Um, but I think there's a lot of fear of like, what am I going to do? And is it like, I've, you know, most people have a moment of like doubt, but then it, it kind of quickly fades away and there's a lot of camaraderie, yeah. you know, and everyone's helping each other. And, and uh, it's interesting yeah, to watch yeah. it happen. The fear is everywhere. Like it's in our office in production, the tech crew going, I need the channel list. We're like, but we don't know what's going on that stage yet, actually. So making it like, sound hmm. really bad. <laughs> Um, you're talking about some kind of minor stresses, but I wanted to ask, like, you know, there's growing awareness of um, the issue, the mental health issues facing musicians today, and I wondered whether a community like people can help in that respect. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I think uh, maybe that's part of it. I think a lot about this also, the mental health, like the lack of structure in the music industry or any kind of... You know, there's no human resources department <laughs> looking after like, hey, you don't seem well. Uh, but when you put yourself into a fam like a big community of artists with a lot of amazing people like Mary that are there to sort of organize and and move mountains, and there's there's just like a camaraderie and a kind of deeper personal connection that happens, and people c also there's a sense of hope and possibility, whereas when you're 
kind of alone with the wall around you as an artist and I'm whoever I am. Like I'm Aaron Dessner, I'm here to play my songs and then I'm going to travel to the next city and do it again. And you're kind of like alone with your thoughts running on fumes a lot of the time. And I think that's where, whether you have a mental health problem or addiction problem or a, you know, personal problem, you can feel quite alone or quite like floating around. A lot of artists, I think, um, when things end, end badly, as they do sometimes for artists, I think it's lack of community support, lack of attention to like what's going on with someone personally. So hopefully this is a, a healthy, I think that's an aspiration is like to create wellness also. You, know? you do see it like as we travel through the world and we meet people who are at Berlin with us, there's like an instant connect, you know, it's like, we were at band camp together, you know, like we had that week. It's really special, actually. It's very hard to articulate. And I often ask them if they can help us with the narrative of that, like, as we find it hard to, it's all well and good to say, oh, it's really special and it's deep, but it's like, what does that mean? Mm -hmm. But uh, there is something that's new about that connection amongst the entire community. It's really nice. Have any of them helped you be able to get close to articulating what that is? They, are, they all have the same d d like difficulty with it. Yeah. Can you? We all have the problem. So. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, there's, we keep coming back to this idea of time and space. Like, mm -hmm. if you give people time and space without pressure to be creative and to be cl collaborative, it's artistically regenerative. Or it's, it's, it, you have amazing energy as an artist but it's also personally just a great it's like being on a retreat or something and but there's a musical or, or artistic component to it but it does feel like you're taking care yeah, of each other everyone seems pushed beyond wherever they've ever gone before like in every respect like me too like yeah the last one in particular yeah oh, fucking hell <laughs> yeah um uh, it's gone, I can't remember what I was going to say. Um, have any other um, organizers or events or um, you know, curators or anybody come to you and said, how do you do this? Are there ways that we could use this model for our events? Yeah, many, yeah. many have called me up and said, how do you do it? And I'm like, I don't know how to tell you. <laughs> like, you need to live it. Yeah. Um, and any anybody else who would run run it would take a different approach potentially. So it's it's very hard to articulate. It's about being super patient and kind. Like the kindness is very important to just like let people go through the process that they need to go through to open themselves up creatively. Um, but like, what does that mean? A nine to five situation, you know, it's like, it's very hard to articulate it. It's like you need to just live it, I think. But we have, so one, one way that it's evolving now is that the residencies and performances are starting to move into other arts institutions. Um, so, for example, we're talking to the Sydney Opera House and to the Basilica in Hudson, New York, where I live, or to, you know, Pioneer Works was the home for the last residency, and they kind of took the financial risk of it and were basically the sponsor, you know, in a sense. And, and then we... It, it, we found that it works very well in that sense also um, to kind of do it differently and, and try it in different spaces. And the space is a big part of it. So the Funkhaus was a huge part, obviously, of of what happened in Berlin. And just having, if that's a one and one, there's nothing like that. Well, maybe there are, but like that's a very rare thing to have this crazy elaborate studio facility to work in um but then we to do it in an old civil war warehouse in red hook brooklyn felt totally different and exciting in a different way yeah. or to do it in sydney in the opera house and all its related facilities that will also be different and hopefully and then each place that it happens the idea is to pull in different communities and local musicians and um and see where it goes, you know. So I think it's a it's an evolu it's it's evolving right now. But a big I think a big step is to let go is to let go of this idea and allow it to appear in different places. You know, it doesn't have to be tightly controlled. It's kind of good if it's the, the like feels not anarchist, but you know, it should it should take different forms. 
It's like open source festivaling, open source mm-hmm. software. Exactly, yeah. open source festival. I like that. Let's use that. Yeah. I guess one of the, you know, we were talking before about how you articulate the spirit of this kind of thing. Just having anything that's oriented around community in this day and age feels kind of radical in and of itself. When mm-hmm. we're so much more isolated than we have been before, people may not even know their neighbours. And also, you know, on an individual, society feels more individualist than it ever has before. People are encouraged to like live their lives as personal brands, mm-hmm. which is horrible. And just like having a group of people that are, are share a mission. I don't know, that feels kind of political at this point in time. Yeah, for sure, yeah. Yeah, I mean, that was also a big part of the idea is like breaking down walls between artists, between people, um, and sharing, you know, why can't we co-work on, why can't we, you know, when you make an album, instead of being like paying everyone the least you can for their involvement, why not pay them the most you can or make everyone a shareholder in that thing that you're making. Um, And so, you know, and be collectivist about art making. So I think that that energy has fed into like the, you know, the the national album that we just made. To me, it feels like a people album. And in fact, a lot of it was recorded at these events because we'd be like, hey, can you sing this song? You know, Lisa Hannigan would just sneak into a closet and record it and like, and that kind of stuff. Um, you know, it, it, there's, it's going the other way now, like into, our, into my day job, which is nice. It's really a good feeling. But I think uh, that's what, how artists feel when they're there. They feel that they're breaking down barriers between each other and I think like we hope that the audience if we can develop a large audience for this kind of output I think it can be unifying you know it can like kind of feels outside of traditional commercial avenues also in a good way so hopefully there's yeah that's a goal. Do you think this way of working, is it something that's really only open to artists that have kind of have a lev- had a level of success that means they can step away from that kind of, those kind of revenue streams or can it work as a bottom-up kind of thing like with that collectivist spirit you mentioned? Absolutely, yeah. We encourage that there are artists on different kind of levels of their career mm-hmm. working together, yeah. But it's, yeah, for, so for sure it's like meant to be equally for Mm-hmm. those that are coming up and those that are maybe already had success, but it's the best part of the challenge because how I feel going into this event is quite different maybe than how someone yeah. who hasn't has yet to find an audience. So like there's a, not a tension, but it's like a, there's different perspectives. But I think the great thing is like by everyone getting being in the same position, essentially. There's nobody, there's no headliners, there's no, no one's getting paid more than each other. So if there's any money, it's being split equally at these events, uh, is a really unifying feeling. And then if there's, I think for artists that are trying to figure out what they want to do or establish themselves, it's a great opportunity to make new work with people you might not normally be in the same room with or just like finding mm-hmm. collaborators mm-hmm. um like an interesting drummer whoever you know like the, you're meeting people um so in that sense i think it's it's just a great opportunity for me personally as someone who i, I don't need to do this i have like a successful career as in the band and stuff but I, it, for me it's an artistic creative need to mm-hmm. change and to like put myself in situations where I'm actually trying stuff. Because not to say, it doesn't take anything away from what my main, what, what I'm known for mostly, but that is like a specific thing, it feels like at this point. Um, and even though we make new music and it's exciting when we make new music and it's my old brothers that I play with all the time, but it doesn't, it's not, it is cool to like get thrown into a room where there's like a composer making weird noise music and then you have to like learn what they're doing. You know, you learn something from that for sure. Um, you mentioned the Sydney Opera House. What else is next? What's coming up? Um, we're talking to so many different venues, festivals, events around the world. Like there's huge interest in what we're doing and how we do it. Um, so we're, we're looking at maybe aiming for four, four events a year. Mm-hmm. Um, and working in collaboration with either a venue or a festival around the world. And in each of those places, embrace local artists as part of it. 
So it's like, we'll, it's an ever expanding community of artists and also like other industry folk, you know, like working with Pioneer Works, it was a really nice experiment. And through that, we've decided, yeah, let's keep doing it this way, actually. Let's lean into the industry more. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. Um, I think we have time for some questions, if anybody has them. I'm not sure if there's a microphone going around, but you can, pro I think there will be in a second. Um, yeah, if we just hang tight a sec, it's coming down. Um, stick your hand up if there's anything that you want to ask, and then somebody up there. Any questions? Go on, it always takes like one person to ask, and then everybody has one. Yes. It's very short. We'll be back in Berlin next time. Do you want to? I think we got it. Um, but when will we be back in Berlin next time? I'm not sure. I, th I feel like. Um, we don't have any plans. We don't have any plans to do one at the Funkhaus soon, but I think it's it's a, it's a special place, so hopefully someday. Yeah. Anybody else? Yeah? Do you have plans of doing any of these co-writing meetings in Spain, or, or who's the next one going to be, and how do you access them? Um, well, so... We would love to do, I mean, I, th I think uh, in a way, I feel like we're here in a small way right now, do, even though it's just Big Red Machine playing, but Big Red Machine is a people project. Um, and it would be, I think it's, yeah, we, we would love to come do this in Spain. Um, there is, we have, e you can email Mary via the, the website, yeah. but we, it's very open. We're kind of open to the world, yeah. open to ideas, open to people writing us. It's not closed off. We do kind of like encourage people to reach out. Uh, like if all of the conversations that are happen, happening right now, are, people have come to us. We're not consciously going out looking for any kind of partnerships, but we're wide open to having conversations with anybody. It's not always the right fit. You know, we do need to do proper due diligence and explore that it's the right fit for what we do and how we do it. Um, but we're very happy to, to dive in and see if it's the right fit and see if it works out. Is it just gonna be you and Justin doing Big Red Machine later or will there be kind of a wider people presence at the show? Not to spoil anything. But. Um, it'll be, yeah, so the idea is like the band is always changing and so we have JT and Brad who are essentially usually there. They play, JT plays drums and Brad plays bass and this, um, they've been a big part of it. But then also Bella, um, so a good example is Bella Blasco who is an amazing recording engineer and who I've known for years as on that side of things, she would be recording a record I was making. Then she started working for the National essentially as our band liaison. She travels around with the National and like helps us do a ton of stuff. But then she's also a really good singer. So one day we were playing Big Red Machine songs and we were just like, Bella, why don't you just sing? Or just, do you want to sing? And she was like, sure. And she already had heard all the songs. So she just like jumped up on stage and started singing. Um, and it's like that. So people, my brother's flying in. He doesn't know the songs really, but he'll just improvise. That'll be great. So he'll be like, you know, messing around in there. And then I think Julian Baker hopefully is going to jump up because she's here to play shows. And it's just, it's an ever changing sort of thing. Amazing. Um, anybody else? Thanks, you guys. Yeah, well, thank you very much for coming. Thank you, thank you guys Laura. for speaking. Thanks, Laura.